Welcome to another panel discussion hosted by Page One Power. My name is Nicholas Chimonis. I'll be moderating today. We'll be talking about the future of search, divination, oracles. Fortunately, we have three such oracles here today. So let's jump right into it. We're, we're broadcasting from beautiful Boise, Idaho. It actually looks almost exactly like that. We're a little off to the west, but this is Boise. <clears throat> I'd like to introduce Jono Alderson. He's the global head of digital at Linkdex. Jono, say hello. Hello. Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us. Next up, we have Eric Inga. You're probably familiar with him from Stone Temple Consulting. Perhaps you've read the book he co-authored, The Art of SEO. Eric, thanks for joining us today. Oh, thanks for having me. I should say good morning since Jono said good afternoon. <laughs> good afternoon. <laughs> Jono is in the UK and the rest of us are all in America. <clears throat> Next up we have Russ Jones, he's the principal search scientist at Moz. You probably used his keyword data if you've ever done SEO before. Russ, thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. Glad to be here. Very excited. All right. And this is me. I am the head of research and development page and power, the occasional webinar host. I also enjoy dabbling in technical SEO frequently. So let's jump into it. How has search evolved from when you first began your career? Let's start with Eric Inga because I believe he's the most seasoned veteran here. <laughs> if we really wanted to talk about when I first began my career, you'd have to start with there was no such thing as search. Uh, except that you went down to the library and you pulled, went through index cards and you found a book and you found what shelf in the library it was on and you went there. But uh, that's pro probably not what you meant. Um, actually, when I began in search, uh, the, it, was, it was so incredibly easy to do stuff. Uh, a friend of mine and I launched a website called online-motorcycle-parts.com, and within seven days of launching that, we were ranking number two for motorcycle parts in Google. Um, I don't think you could do that today. <laughs> Perhaps in big. So, uh, yeah, perhaps in Bing, yes, and, and you know, Apple search when it comes out, and, you know, all these kinds of things, right? It's, uh, it's, uh, um, so, yeah, uh, it was very keyword-centric. Uh, there wasn't really much notion of authority. It was a very relevance-based algorithm, and it was easy to fool just by repeating a keyword over and over again. Um, so, you know, clearly there's a lot of other factors in the algorithm, and uh, there's a lot of attempt to measure authority and user engagement in ways that's hard for us to uh, uh, actually forecast exactly what Google is doing in terms of user engagement. But, but I think maybe to give a broader statement of how it's changed, I think for me it's just you now have to take a holistic approach around how am I going to survive this game and be a winner two, three, five years down the road. And, you know, back in the early 2000s, you didn't need to do that. Absolutely. You know what? You actually exposed, I believe, why I became an SEO. And I, I think it was my time in, in junior high school when I was a librarian. I loved the yeah. decimal system. I absolutely yeah. loved it. I loved organizing. I loved optimizing the shelves. And I, I finally understand why I'm an SEO. <clears throat> <laughs> I thought you were going to say because of easy money, but then uh, you gave a much more serious answer. <laughs> easy money is great, too. <laughs> if, only, if, if, if only it were easy. I joined the game when it was becoming a little more difficult. I, I My career in SEO began just actually in mid-2011, so right when the pandas were hitting and I saw the first iteration of Penguin working at a link-building company that fortunately always kind of believed in doing it the right way, less of the manipulation and the spammy tricks, trying to earn the links that really matter and make sense to a user. So that's why Page One Power took off right around the time I joined in April 2012 as Penguin hit, and we were, we were there to provide a little bit more of a legitimate link building service. So Russ, let's, uh, let's, let's get your perspective. What, you know, where, where did you come into this game and where do you see it going? Well, I'll, I'll start with a, a little bit of uh, just reiterating what Eric said. Um, uh, I was on uh, track to become an attorney as my twin brother is, my older brother is, uh, but then decided to stick with this SEO thing. And I remember having a conversation with my twin brother, Scott, 
uh, and he asked me, why are you doing this? And I said, stupid people can make money in SEO. And <laughs> this, was, this was back in 2005. And uh, I, I don't think that's... I, I don't think that's really the case anymore. Um, you either have to ha have intelligence or investment, uh, one or the other, um, to really succeed uh, and to kind of one-up that uh, online-motorcycle-store.com. At one point, I had a double-dash domain. I had hearing-aids, <laughs> which apparently is legitimate or legal. Uh, I, I was surprised that it worked. Um, that being said, you know, if we want to step outside just like how easy it is, um, I think the 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 core, or the, you know, like the core factors that have um, you know that, that began search engines um, have remained largely the same. Uh, you know, just relevancy and importance, content and links, and you know, there's been an ebb and flow of which seems to matter more, and most of that ebb and flow, I think, has actually been uh, the supply and demand of those things, like how easy is it to get good content that can get through Google's filters, or how easy is it to get links that can get through Google's filters, not as so much as core algo changes. But I, I think there is um, one pretty big and important shift that we've seen over the last year and a half, two years, um, which has been this... Uh, I, I would say range of changes to Google uh, dealing with query disambiguation um, and uh, entity search, et cetera. This, uh, there are lots of words, phrases for it. We would normally categorize them under hummingbird and rank brain. But essentially, if there was one big shift um, that I think is bigger than an update like Panda or, or Penguin or all the way back to the Florida updates um, for, uh, for Google, I would say it's uh, that now there isn't really the same degree of a one-to-one -one relationship between the keyword searched and the optimization on the page relative to that keyword. And I think that's where we're going to see the biggest shifts in SEO over the next couple of years. It's still going to be about content and links, but uh, what qualifies a good link or good content is now going to be uh, broadened by this uh, better understanding of the English language, well, of multiple languages, but certainly the English language that Google now has. Sure. As long as you can say that Rank Brain took over the whole algorithm, uh, I'm good with that. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I think you raise a really good point that essentially it has always been about the fabric of the internet, content and links. The internet is nothing but those two things that it comprises everything, whether you're talking about social, that's still content and links, I mean, et cetera. But like you said, what's really changed is Google's ability to understand keywords and disambiguate all the different variations. I wish I had the stat off the top of my head of how many new queries, new unique queries Google sees per day that they've never seen before. Does anyone have that? Well, the latest one I think is 15% that I've heard. Um, when I first heard it, it was 25%, but that was uh, six years ago maybe that I heard that number uh, and they've yeah, since uh, gradually revised the number downwards. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, actually, in it, it looks like it's back up in June of two. No, no, you're right. That's six years ago. Sorry, that was 2007. They said 20. <laughs> in in 2013, they said 15 percent they've never seen before. Um, so uh, yeah, I think that's uh, approximately the right number. Cool. All right, John, let's pass it to you. Or sorry, Eric, if you had a final thought, go ahead and share it. Oh no, I was just going to say it just blows people's minds when you explain to them that that many queries have never been seen before. But by all, all means, let, let's hear, let's hear uh, general thoughts. Cool. Um, so I, controversially, I think it's a bit broken. Um, so I started as a techie, uh, as a developer, uh, entirely self-taught, and I got obsessed by the idea of how do you do this better. Um, what's the perfect title tag look like? Should I use alt attributes or title attributes, etc.? And through trial and error and the subsequent traffic, etc., became a technical SEO without ever realizing it was a thing. And it was so simple and it was so purist. And then I kind of fell into the world of SEO and encountered links and authority signals and it all became frustratingly complex. And I think um, that complexity has spiraled and we've now ended up in a, pro a, a world where Google's original mission of organizing and categorizing the world's information has morphed into shaping it because their processes and their systems aren't quite still capable of understanding truly what relevance and authority looks like. And now we're left with um, 
a world where they're imposing their view of what good marketing and good branding looks like, um, which leads to the this kind of awkward coexistence of paid and organic that we have at the moment, that Google are defining the moral code for websites and what good looks like and what bad looks like, um, to the point where, for example, guest blogging and directories are now no longer a thing. Whereas intrinsically, they're neither good nor bad, but our reaction, our collective reaction to the way their model has worked and been flawed has shaped the fundamental makeup of the web, which is a terrifying thing to have done. Um, so we're kind of left in this place where, for example, artisanal crafters also have to be great marketers and write great content in order to sell their hand-carved wooden furniture rather than playing on the quality of their product versus big e-commerce websites with big budgets who can just churn out content and generic copy which influences their performance and their propensity to be discovered. So it's a bit broken at both ends of the scale. And I think that's why it's so important for Google to be pushing so hard on understanding context and intent and meaning so that they can cut out a lot of this artificial modeling of what relevance looks like and connect the user's intent to the best destination. I think we're almost there at this tipping point where our, the entire way we have thought about search, about generating relevant signals and authority signals, will no longer be applicable because Google will be, uh, via rank brain, phenomenally more capable than we'll ever be of understanding what good looks like. Well, I've, this is Russ. I wanted to chime in there. I, I completely agree. We had this uh, discussion a while ago, and I think Mark Trafagan was in on it, who's now at Stone Temple. Uh, but I, I called it the tragedy of the 10 blue links, which was that yeah. regardless of what Google tried to do, consolidating recommendations down to 10 blue links and in, oh. in, in your best attempt at understanding uh, what a person is searching for is potentially dangerous. Um, I just searched for restaurant where I'm located and you know it, it recommended three decent restaurants in my area. Uh, but the reality is if somebody came up to me and asked me about a good restaurant uh, around us, I would immediately ask them back, well, what are you looking for? Yeah. Um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't try and interpret from the data that they've given me an answer. I would say, I can't give you a good answer without more information. And I think that we see this across the board with Google, but not just Google, any search engine in that regard. And because of that, it's it shaped the success and failures of businesses. It's caused consolidations. Um, because, uh, like you said, our artisanal providers can't actually compete, and uh, I'm, I'm not really quite sure what the solution is, um, but I doubt there's one that actually solves that problem and at the same time allows a, uh, a search engine to remain profitable. No, well, I mean, there's, there's, there is something. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, after you. Yeah, I mean, personalization is a big part of the story, right? So. Uh, um, you know, the search engines can and do learn over time things like, well, I tend to always go to that Italian restaurant around the uh, around the corner, or uh, um, and so maybe I'm not in my normal city, and I know I eat Italian a lot, uh, which I don't, but I'm just using this as an example. Um, and you know, I'm in another city, and it's more likely to potentially to suggest uh, an Italian restaurant. So they can try to do that, and. It, it's kind of an interesting point, though, that you bring up there, Russ, which is the normal human interaction doesn't appear to be the one we want with a machine, uh, where it actually immediately shoots back what kind of food you want. But maybe that will change as we get into higher levels of personalization and more used to interacting by voice. Well, it's yeah, a big too, isn't it? Fair. Because there's also the risk of self-confirmation bias with over-personalization, right? Yes. Serendipity is good. We like to be surprised. We like new things. Right. Well, we should, or we should want to broaden our horizons or get alternate alternative perspectives in our search results rather than, well, this person is a Republican, so let's only feed them Republican search results. Is that really, is that really the best thing? Is Google then in some ways influencing in a way that they should not? Right. John, did you have something to add to that? No, no, you caught it, just that idea that um, the continued existence of the 10 blue links in whatever format they are is hugely important because there's got to be some kind of process in between putting a very raw query in that lacks all of that context and then having some kind of ability to then confirm or choose or research. Um, 
uh, we'll come on to it later, I'm sure, but I think there's a huge risk that as things like personal assistance and Google Now continue to take off, we're going to lose some of that transparency, and that's going to push us even further into this world where the winners are the people who do big, um, flashy PR campaigns to simulate relevance, and the, the we'll move more into a place where the big brands with the big budgets win, and the question that the people who have the the real value or are potentially more relevant lose out because they don't have the budgets or the access. Well, I mean, if you think about it, though, this notion that people who do really effective marketing. And notice I chose not to say big budgets, but uh, <laughs> but big budgets certainly can be one way to do really effective marketing. You can spend your way through it. Uh, um, you know, will win, but that's that's not unique to the internet or the web. That's that was yeah. true 30 years ago. So, uh, but the the other thing that's interesting about this is because there's so many different things going on uh, and new things popping up all the time on the interwebs. Um, um, there's always a new opportunity for an aggressive, fast-moving, small player to build a name, right, and and create a niche for themselves, which is distinct from uh, everybody else there out there, and, and make progress. So, even though you're right, the big budgets is sort of the easy way to to create huge visibility. If you're the first one emerging, and I'm moving a little bit beyond search here, right? If you're the first one to uh, become a huge player on a new social network, for example, yes. that creates a new opportunity for you, uh, which is really, um, you know, not something we would have been able to say 30 years ago. Yeah, that's absolutely true. You know, Jono, Jono mentioned something earlier that really stuck out to me, which was that Google is transforming the very nature of the web in terms of rolling out things like nofollow, something that you know, never existed before, or Google authorship, which was one of their failed transformations of the web. AMP, that remains to be seen. And actually, I think this is a good segue into our second question here, which is what search features are you most interested in today? I'd really like to kick this off with a discussion about AMP and whether or not, you know, the panel sees this as as something that really will be long lasting or, or is it going to go the way of the Google authorship dodo? Ah, dodos, yes. Uh, so, I mean, a, a, my opinion, I think AMP is, uh, uh, has legs. Uh, our testing here showed a 71% reduction in page size across a few sample pages, and pages that were scoring 42 in Google's PageSpeed Insights uh, went up to an 88, so it was pretty dramatic. Um, there's surely issues with the implementation of AMP you know, because it's a stripped down version of HTML and all that. But, I mean, you have to do something like that to make your page faster for mobile devices. So, speed in mobile is a big, big deal. That's my my short two-minute answer to that question. Um, I think it's worth um, considering Google's commercial model when you think about AMP, which is essentially to make the process of people searching for something, consuming something, and then Google monetizing that the way that things work. Um, and in the context of mobile, that's a particularly poor experience. And when you consider that 30 something percent of Google's um, AdWords revenue is for mobile searches, that's a huge chunk of cash to be on the line. If people um, have poor experiences with um, consuming content on mobile, they're going to go and they're going to use apps, they're going to use things like Pocket, they're going to go directly to the news providers apps. It's imperative that Google keeps searches in the search in the search ecosystem, searching for content, clicking on the pages, and either being tracked so that they can be um, segmented and put to demographic buckets for things like um, oh, um, uh, the content network or being monitored, advertised to you directly. It's absolutely imperative. So this is, if nothing else, a very clever play by them to maintain the normalcy of search as a way of consume, discovering and consuming content. And in that sense, it's very much a, a commercial play to moat to build competitive distance away from other options and alternatives. I think where it will go, which will be really interesting, as adoption grows, there's a concept of things like aggregated AMP, sorry, aggregated AMP results, that if there are 10 e-commerce providers who have AMP commerce pages, it's not unfeasible to imagine that Google might create a hybrid AMP experience which takes components from those and builds its own solution, and they essentially become the interaction layer on top of the web 
and all of these e-commerce sites and all the brands behind them essentially just become APIs and data providers. Hmm. Yeah, I'll, um, I'll, I'll chime in there with, I, I, I've had a lot of mixed feelings with AMP. I remember the first time uh, I saw an AMP result and I clicked on it and it was, I, I couldn't describe it other, thing, other than uh, the same amount of magic I felt when I moved from a 56K modem to <laughs> first stable internet access and, and saw the change in speed. I mean, it was, it was truly remarkable. Um, and I think from that respect, there is something to be said that they've got something that's good for users. And there's also something to be said about they've got something that's good for them, which is that it does give them uh, a control over this uh, layer of content in the mobile web, and uh, which gives them more control over revenue streams. And so if it's good for Google, and at least it's defensively good for users, I think it's going gonna, it's gonna to have some sticking power. Uh, whether, I, whether I like it or not, I, I can't say that I'm, a, I'm really a big fan, but I can't give, I can only give in principle arguments against it. I can't give practical arguments against it. Um, I think that the people who are upset with it, myself included, are upset with uh, the idea of Google having this much control and not so much upset with um, uh, having really fast web pages. Right. Um, so I, I, I think uh, that, I, I think it's hard to win in principle arguments. Um, and, and so I think this one's going to have more staying power, for example, than uh, Google+. Plus. Well, and you know, also uh, we, we started the conversation with the notion of you know, it's going to have more staying power than Google authorship. Um, don't don't overlook the possibility that the whole authorship program was just a training process or an algorithm for the, to help them better understand authorship, and that the yeah, program may have, may have been a complete success for Google for all we know, right? Uh, and you know, they kind of lured us in. We, you get the photos and all that. Sorry, that was a brief aside uh, on that. But I, I think uh, uh, John was point about um, Google wanting to get you out of the world of apps. That, that's that's a huge point. You know, that, that's not that they they're doing well in apps. By the way, they have six of the top uh, nine apps, or five of the top nine apps, and Facebook has the other ones uh, except for one. Between the two of them, they have eight of the nine top apps. But but it's still it's not as friendly a place. So. You know what, I'd, I'd, like, I'd like to interject with a, a question from the audience, or more so a comment from the audience, which is that implementation of AMP is convoluted. It requires small companies to hire someone that has specific experience with AMP. Plugins for WordPress don't answer 100% of the requirements for the AMP project as well. And this is, I believe, something we'll continue to see that only, this is mentioned earlier, big budgets or big companies or at least those that understand the constantly evolving landscape and are willing to hire the right person, they have a significant advantage. And I think, you know, the, the technology that Google rolls out will continue to give the upper hand to bigger companies, less of the artisanal providers that are doing their own website on WordPress by themselves while they're also in the workshop crafting all day. It, it kind of gives a significant disadvantage, in my opinion, to a lot of the smaller players. And search features in general have, have continued towards that trend. Would you agree? So this is a, um, a short-term challenge that's actually much bigger than that. The, the question is, um, as content consumption and the mediums that happens in continue to fragment, because it's not just AMP, there's Facebook instant pages, there's Apple News, there will be a dozen more by this time next week, and some of them might only exist for six months or a year, but that's where the audience is, and it's where the audience is consuming content. The challenge is, how do I transform myself from being a business that has a website to being a business that has content which is deployed into multiple locations. And yeah, there are tech requirements there and it will require people to rethink about how they structure their back ends. But when you look at um, WordPress's reinvention recently, for example, into being a JavaScript first platform, this is in order to solve for this problem tomorrow that I should be able to pivot my output into six different apps rather than just a website. Yes, and by the way, um, you know, as a uh, Entrepreneurial type guy. When I when I hear things like that, my immediate reaction is opportunity. Sure. So you get back to yeah. are you going to gain an edge on the big guy with a big budget? If I can be nimble and quick and do this stuff before they do it, I can gain some traction and some share and 
and, and grow my business and you know I, I love those sorts of situations. Yeah, and I, I mean I, I I agree with that and I feel very similar, but when you talk to the average small business owner that is busy running their business, it's rare that they're even aware these things exist. And you know, to that to that end, even with AMP results, it says beneath the result AMP and it has the little lightning logo in the circle. But if you try to click that, it doesn't take you anywhere. There's not even an explanation to the layman of what is this result. I mean, perhaps yes, users will click AMP results and realize they load very quickly. Maybe they'll Google search AMP for themselves. But it's even there's even not a, a an entry. The barrier to entry is higher because Google's not even showing. I mean, it says the word AMP, but if you click it, well, there's nothing to click. It's not a link. It, it doesn't. It's, you know, it's, it doesn't say like you're blocked in robots.txt. Click here to learn more, kind of thing. Sure. So I've always kind of wondered even, and I should just start polling my friends, when you see this, what do you think this is? I mean, do you, do you understand what AMP means? Have you, have you encountered many of those results, and do you understand what, what this really is? I've seen eBay starting to show some AMP results, actually, and it's kind of strange because first you'll see an intermittent page that takes you to an eBay product, but then if you click anything, it takes you to regular eBay and continues to load more slowly. I feel like that's a little bit of friction that has yet to be really worked out, at least in terms of the e-commerce space. Well, beyond that as well, for anything that's essentially not an article or a product page, if you've got a site with multiple types of content, it's almost inevitable that somebody's going to have a really all broken experience where they come in via AMP, it's excellent, and then they get pushed out into a mobile site which just falls over. Sure. Right, so, well, the support for retail uh, type pages, uh, commerce pages, is it really formal in AMP at this point in time? Uh, so it's interesting that eBay pages are beginning to show up, uh, uh, but that's not even an announced uh, component of AMP, which has been largely initially targeted at uh, uh, news pages and content pages. Sure. So Russ, you do a lot of work with Dr. Pete, right, in terms of with your keyword research and analyzing SERP features. You know, what else? What else really interests you in, in terms of now, and what do you? What's in the coming future? Well, I I I don't get a, to work with Dr. P nearly as much as I like, but you have hit on an area that we've had a, a decent bit of crossover, um, and and that's just cert features in general. Uh, I I think probably uh, the biggest um, or, or the most interesting part about um, cert features is not. Uh, so much what a SERP feature tells us about the SERP, it's more what the SERP feature tells us about the query. Um, one of the things we did some research with, with our clickstream data was to determine the relationship of individual SERP features and groups of SERP features on the likelihood a user will end up clicking on an organic result. So you can imagine uh, that if you've got uh, giant maps there sitting on the page for a local query that the likelihood somebody will click one of the 10 blue links as opposed to one of the items in the maps is lower than if there were no map there in the first place. Um, and you would expect, or at least uh, common sense uh, intuition might be that any addition, <coughs> excuse me, of SERP features to the page would uh, decrease the click-through rate to organic uh, by some margin. But what we've actually found is that that's not the case in some in some situations. For example, uh, one of the combinations that we saw was uh, a knowledge panel, uh, site links, and tweets um, corresponded with a near 100% um, organic click-through rate, like a very, very high organic click-through rate above what you would expect. And then when you go and look at the only queries that uh, have those um, features, uh, they're all major active brands. So I think one of them at the time was Louis Vuitton. I don't know if they still have the same uh, SERP features now, but this was you know, maybe six months ago. And so what was happening is everyone was clicking on the Louis Vuitton organic link. And uh, that was happening you know, nearly 100% of the time. So what the SERP features in that situation did was uh, not really impact what the users did. What it really did was tell us about the query, which was that queries that have these SERP features are actually active brands. And we know they're active because they've got tweets associated with them. Um, so sometimes you'd have brands that aren't active on the web and they don't engage with users as much, so 
when they're searched, they don't get the, the same sort of organic interaction. Um, on the other hand, we see wide volatility for other features, like uh, your standard um, featured snippet box at the top of the page um, could have almost no impact, or it could, uh, when it's, for example, in the type of a calculator, it could remove nearly all organic traffic whatsoever. So if you search for like CNY to USD to uh, convert the Chinese yuan to um, US dollars, you will get, you will, if you were to look at the clickstream data, you'd see about a 0% click-through rate to organic because everyone just goes ahead and uses the calculator on that page. But other featured snippets that are the same size, diameter, take as much page, uh, you know, might only impact organic by 1%. So there's this huge variety of of ways in which um, SERP features can infl influence uh, organic click-through rate. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm very much interested in following those trends and building models that help users determine the right keywords to target based on the likelihood that a user will end up clicking on an organic search result. Sure, and it really speaks volumes to the concept of optimizing for intent beyond just doing your typical keyword research and optimizing for volume and competition level necessarily, but really understanding that every different query has a different intent and regardless of, I think there's sometimes sweeping advice that's like, oh, well, you shouldn't target this query because there's all these SERP features and it's going to be bad. Well, that could be true. It could also not be true depending on the intent of the individual keyword. And that's, you know, I mean, that's absolutely in line with what RankBrain is doing and trying to better understand the query. And I, I think that, that makes sense for us to be doing as SEOs as well. Well, and then there's the idea of, okay, there's all these features, but can I play in those features? So sure. in case of featured snippets, um, you know, there are things you can do to increase your likelihood of getting a featured snippet. So if I can, if I'm currently ranking number seven in the results and I make modifications to my content, uh, it might not change my ranking uh, in the regular links, you know, from position seven, but I might suddenly be in position zero. Right, and uh, um, so that's the other way to think about it is you know, leverage those new features to your advantage. Right, you see, that's, that's that's small players are big, beating out big players is by you know targeting a snippet. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Sorry, go ahead, Jono. Just saying, we see um, a whole lot of data around this where people um, who are running around that position seven, eight point um, tactically target the answer boxes at the bottom of the page, the short links, the definitions, and then do better than they would if they were trying to get to third or fourth, for, for example. So definitely these provide a whole new little marketplaces where people can think tactically and try and take advantage. Sure. Well, I think that this actually bleeds quite well into question number three. What's the next innovation impact search? How do you expect search to evolve over the next five years? You want to take it from there, Jono? Sure. Um, so I think there's some really cool stuff coming up with um, personal assistance um, and preemptive search. So whether that's um, Google Now on your phone, uh, anticipating what you want, what you need, or whether it's you talking to your Google Home or Amazon Echo device. Um, I think the challenge there for us and for search is that if you are trying to be more prominent and to quote unquote rank higher in whatever context that means, you're already too late at that point. I, as search professionals, we'll need to shift our behaviors and our focus to um, earning recognition and brand preference before people search so that when they do have needs, um, you're the brand of choice and you've already been surfaced and you're visible. Um, and that's going to be a particularly interesting challenge uh, given that we'll have to change the way that uh, we report within organizations, change the way we budget, etc. You've then also got the challenge of um, the fragmenting marketplace. So things like Etsy, like eBay, like in-app transactions will mean that less and less um, interaction with consumer behavior happens on our big um, fortressy e-commerce websites that will be increasingly distributed as things like AMP mean that people aren't coming to our sites directly. And then consumers are becoming more educated. So you've got multi-device, multi-visit behavior, people looking at reviews, understanding pros and cons, and building these kind of complex brand preferences. It makes all of this very, very hard to distill down into something as simple as a how many visits did I get or where am I ranking? And I think our big challenge um, to cope with all of this will be moving from saying how is my website doing to saying 
what's the experience like when people search and how do I ensure that I'm well represented or that I'm promoted in some kind of preemptive search. Um, even if that's not necessarily my site, it might be somebody else's site with a review about me. So all of this will converge and require us to fundamentally change the way we think about search from being how do I get higher in the results to how do I understand what people think and how they feel and therefore what they do. It's going to be a fun game. Own reporting is still an unsolved problem that only seems to get worse as time progresses. Mm -hmm. There's a you know a really really great presentation by Rand Fishkin that that I saw in Boston over at Search Love, and he's presenting this idea of of traditional reporting that was much easier at one point, especially when we had keyword data and, and Google Analytics and not provided wasn't so much of an issue and AdWords wasn't restricting data, et cetera. Um, you know, and, and how, how do we actually, how do we move, what is the future? How do we move into better reporting as the data seems to only continually shrink? Yeah, that's going to be an interesting challenge, isn't it? And it puts us much more um, in line with where things like traditional PR and TV have been forever. And ironically, we've spent, well, I was going to say decades, but we've spent the entirety of our existence essentially pointing and laughing at traditional media and the way that people measure things like column inches in press and saying, how we're more, so much more sophisticated than you. And actually, now there's a lot more parity between those, and we might have to go back grovelling to those guys who still get more budget than us, who still arguably have as big an impact, and say, can we learn about how you report, how you get buy-in? Maybe things like column inches are actually quite a powerful metric when you're looking at just coverage and visibility as a success criteria rather than leads of conversion. So we might have to look to the, um, the old world of it. That's an interesting point. That really is. Hmm. So part of this, too, is that we're looking at, um, uh, uh, Jono, you, you uh, alluded to all this, but I mean, this is massive fragmentation that's going to happen in device types. Yeah. Uh, there's a forecast I saw from Chartbeat where by the year 2020, which is a meager four years away, that uh, more than 75% of the installed base of devices um, connected devices will be something other than a smartphone, a tablet, or a traditional PC. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, and you know, start thinking about that. That's a staggering revelation. Now, many of those devices you aren't necessarily going to be expecting to interact with on a uh, on a regular basis, but I think you're going to see more and more of this notion of voice interaction and uh, you know the digital assistant uh, kind of thing that uh, will help you track your your uh, thought threads or you know whatever you're currently working on uh, across devices and platforms and um, you know that's it's going to be a very dynamic environment and you know, when you when you step back and you think about what does that mean it means okay it's like there's going to be so many things going on that I can't imagine you have a path to success if you haven't built some level of brand, even if it's a local brand. Yeah, absolutely. Um, because even if you try and continue to operate in a world where you say, how do I rank higher? How do you rank higher in what? If I'm saying, hey, Google Now or hey, Alexa, I, I order me a pizza, which set of results, if that even makes sense, are you trying to compete? And actually, the, the only thing you can do is attempt to already have brand preference and to be relevant and to be known and to have a relationship with the consumer. And that there, there suddenly isn't a world where you can say, I'm six out of 10 or any of those kind of metrics. I, I, I'm going to um, bite the bullet here and play devil's advocate a bit. I, well, <laughs> I, I, I certainly agree with the importance of, of building a brand. Um, just just because it continues to pay dividends in the future, even when you're, you're not really continuing to invest in it the way you had it earlier. But I, I think there is a, a, another problem. You mentioned earlier fragmentation where you know, people stay inside of Etsy or people stay inside of a you know, different type of app or maybe inside AMP. Um, and I, I think you hit the nail on the head there to a degree. And I, I'm concerned that uh, if uh, especially a small or an aspiring small business decides to try to be a jack of all trades um, across all of the platforms that are relevant to them, they will fail at all of them because they've simply uh, divided their resources too broadly. And so I, I think that um, there are going to have to be some smart choices about things 
that you can focus on. It's going to come from good data and good reporting, as you mentioned earlier, where you could say, all right, well, what I get for my dollar in this particular medium, whether it be search or not, um, will, will be a decision they have to make. And I think the, the, the question you asked about, uh, or, you, or the example that was given of asking, ordering a pizza from Alexa is really important. If we start seeing this consolidation beyond the tragedy of 10 blue links to the, you know, maybe the tragedy of one Alexa answer, uh, you know, whatever we want to call it. <laughs> um, who, whoever succeeds there, um, you know, gets the whole pie. And now that whole pie is only part of the bigger picture. But if you, know, you could imagine you had uh, 10 competitors in five different spaces, five of those competitors all decided to try and like evenly compete, you know, like do the, the sort of like holistic approach, and the other five decide to target really heavily, you know, maybe they put 80% into one, 80% into another, and so on, and then distribute the 20% they have left over across the other five. There's a real possibility that the way, it, um, you know, it pans out in that case is, is that you've got five different winners for five different sites, and the, the ones who decided to spread, um, you know, their, their marketing dollars thin end up not ranking number one in any of them. And in fact, uh, you know, they might rank two through six in all of them uh, because uh, they, they've almost got to number one, but the guy who decided to put a lot more of his worth there. And I'll give it a, an example of this that was fascinating to me from about four years ago, five years ago. We had a customer come to us um, and uh, we asked, you know, like, where are you getting all your business now? Because they weren't ranking in Google. Um, and they said Yellow Pages. And I was shocked. I was like, who uses Yellow Pages anymore? And the guy went down the numbers. He was like, look, the average Yellow Page that actually makes its way into a house sits there for about six years, which means that uh, they still get phone calls from Yellow Page books that were placed six years ago. He said nobody goes there to pay for ads anymore because everybody thinks it's dead but it's not, um, you know, there's still a, a, enough um, people looking at it out there. And uh, three, unlike any other marketplace out there, if I pay enough money, I can own the whole page and I can own the very first page of it. So there's a, um, there are these opportunities to dominate one vertical or one of those fragmented or fractured uh, environments and I think uh, some of the group or some of the businesses that are most successful will see those opportunities and, and focus on them as opposed to necessarily uh, you know, trying to be all things to all people on all devices at all times. Well, I completely agree with that actually and um, nothing I uh, said was meant to suggest that you shouldn't <laughs> open a few dollars because I mean especially for a small business it's, it's far better to concentrate on one or two things and, and do them extremely well than the, to to you know, do a miserable job at, at, a, at a whole bunch. But so, I really like I really like to cake what you say with straw man arguments to make it sound like I'm smart. Uh, <laughs> well, no, no, I think it was a very good uh, uh, extrapolation. Let's put it that way, because I you know I do think, but I do think the idea of having a strong brand so that when people go to a new device, they will intrinsically look for you there. Agreed. So they have that association is a powerful thing. You know, I'd like to touch on one thing that was mentioned earlier, which is the idea of, okay, is the tragedy of 10 blue links, but moving even far in through future thinking, the idea of the, the tragedy of one answer, one definitive answer. In some ways, we've seen this happening in Google with instant answer boxes and, and knowledge graph panels and even some of that kind of thing. Um, but at the same time, they are still keeping those 10 blue links on the page or sometimes eight or, or what have you. Is, are we safe, really, from that being distilled down to just one answer because it is already the best way to display it? Google understands, perhaps, that there needs to be some diversification, that it's human nature to be curious and to want more than just one answer, or are we already well on our way towards idiocracy? I, I, I don't think so. I really don't. I think there's an enormous amount of commercial pressure uh, to not do that. Um, uh, I mean, even in the, the strongest results, which were the original uh, American Online uh, results and click-through rate by search position for 10 blue links, the first 
result did get 42% of the clicks, which is a big number, but it means 58% went somewhere else. Uh, and uh, I think there's a really major disincentive to get down to a single answer, um, uh, uh, quite frankly, because if if I'm not if I'm if 58% of the people are going to be dissatisfied with the answer you give me, there's too many other places where I can go to to get an answer that I like better. It's worth considering that Google's objective here isn't necessarily to get the user to the best page. It's not even to provide the best search results. It's to provide a good search experience for the user. That whole thing has to feel right and safe and normal because that's how they monetize. So arguably, even if they could accurately predict that number one perfectly 80-90% of the time, there's a real risk that it compromises the, the broader search experience and you, you do more harm than good because people lose faith and they stop using Google, so Google stop monetizing them. I will, uh, once again, because I love to, to do it to play the devil's advocate, I, I think you're right, in especially in terms of g general organic, but I think voice search um, uh, yeah. is, is a, a really interesting uh, phenomenon because people don't want to hear a list of things read off to them. Uh, so this is a, a big problem where I am with pharmacies. Randomly, if I both, um, or with a lot of local businesses now that I think about it, if I were to ask for, um, uh, you know, Google, you know, directions to the closest CVS, uh, it will take me to a CVS that's about four miles further away from the one that I use. Uh, and it, for no reason other than uh, Google has just decided it, it doesn't like that CVS. And I say it that way because it is listed, it is there, and it is closer, but it gives me a different one. Um, the same thing with uh, the bank, BB&T. Uh, you know, my wife like swerved across four lanes of traffic because we saw a BB&T sign about uh, two miles before the one that Google told us uh, was the closest to our house. Um, and so I think, I, I think there, there is going to be um, this give and take, and as long as users don't know they're getting an unoptimized answer or an imperfect answer, they'll assume they're getting the right one. And uh, the, I think that's the, my skeptical concern, that uh, Google will never get a thumbs down or will get very few thumbs down or whatever metric they're using um, if people don't realize that Google actually got it wrong. Do you have to follow their GPS directions off a cliff for them to finally realize <laughs> that they were wrong? Uh, do you know that the directions that they gave you were the fastest directions? Well, that's um, a good point, especially, I mean, they've said time and time again, we're trying to build the Star Trek computer. And when the Star Trek computer gives answers, it gives one answer and without attribution. And if they build a Star Trek computer, I'll be happy. You know, I'm not going to complain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fine. That, it'll just cool. be worth it'll it. It's, it'll be cool enough. That's worth it. Yeah, there okay. you go. The problem, though, in the Star Trek universe, that humankind has reached some pinnacle of civilization where we don't have wars and we don't have economies and food is made from replicators, we're going to have that answer machine, but without all of that. So I, I don't know if that's I don't, that's dangerous. That's scary to me. Just don't wear a red shirt while you're, uh, oh, never mind. A... <laughs> I got it. I got it. I got it. Yes. I got the difference. Well, I think we have time for one more question here. How do you identify meaningful trends that will have a lasting impact in search versus experience, experiments that may die on the vine? In some ways, I feel that a lot of what we've been put through is, is really just data farming for Google, for them to run a test and then they make a decision where whether it's live or not, authorship being an example. If you're a conspiracy theorist, you could say disavowing links was maybe another example. Um, but what, what do you gentlemen think? Russ, why don't you kick us off? Uh, I, I always like to um, ask myself the question of just the reproducibility um, of any kind of tactic. So uh, the future of search, whenever I, some new technique or uh, strategy is presented to you, just to ask how easy it is for a competitor to reproduce it. And that will give you a, a, an idea of how long the tactic will be successful. Because um, it, it, you know, even if Google never figured out how to stop it, as long as uh, 10 or more competitors do the same thing, then it 
it becomes you know as valuable as putting a keyword into your meta keywords tag. Everybody does it, and it's no longer useful. So uh, that's always been you know I think one of the major um, you know kind of like yardsticks I use whenever trying to or litmus tests I use on on uh, potential new strategies or tactics. Just straight up, how hard will it be for a competitor to reproduce? On that note, what do you think, really, I mean, you, you've talked a lot about rank brain and, and really how to interpret, it. I think, the right way, which is that it's, you know, it's understanding queries better. How does that, I mean, when you see that being, that's probably meaningful and probably not going away. How does that actually, is, right, that, I mean, what, I how think, does that change I your think that. I think that's actually a perennial question in SEO, which is the uh, what I call the multi-keyword problem. Um, you've only got so many characters in the title, so many in the description, and so many in a reasonable page length. And now that we've got a lot of uh, words and related words to optimize for as opposed to the old one keyword for one page, um, how do we create a thorough, uh, relevant piece of content that broadly uh, matches, uh, you know, the, the different interpretation layers that Google has has created. Um, I think we're going to see a lot of tools. I know we're going to see some tools come out around that. Uh, and I think that multi-keyword problem is something that will need to be solved. Will be around for a long time. And I think that we'll also have uh, some good solutions for it. Well, I must tip my hat to Mazda's keyword tool in terms of, I, I absolutely love the different ways you can you can tell the tool to interpret the word you've given it, to tell it to have it give you questions back all surrounding I mean, I love that. I absolutely love that. And if, if anyone in the audience has not used Moz's keyword tool, you must go play around with it immediately as soon as this webinar is complete. I take no credit for that. Uh, the, the, unfortunately, I didn't work on that part of it. Uh, and the, the team we had behind it was really amazing. Eric, what do you think? What, what, how do you actually identify if a, if a trend is impactful or if it's just an experiment? So I, I'm going to actually uh, uh, take a tack of answering this from the perspective of, let's say Google tries something, uh, some new feature, and they put it out there, and is it going to last or not? And uh, from, from my perspective, the, um, uh, you have to get to what's the meaningful user value or perceived user value of it. So we'll go back to our earlier conversation. We can contrast authorship, um, where I think the perceived user value, and we could have told this up front, was, was you know, low, right? Uh, I mean, certainly the value of having an author's picture in the search results, um, you know, kind of feels a little bit like a low value item. Um, so, and contrast that with AMP, where the user value, where, where even Ross admits that it's blazingly fast and he likes that part of it, um, uh, you know, um, that user value is high. So when you look at those kinds of things, that's how I would try to predict, you know, whether or not something I see um, is going to have staying power. In terms of, in, but what, what, how does that affect what you do? Do you still, I mean, as with the entrepreneurial spirit, do you go for the early adoption just in case it's going to take off, regardless of if you think it's going to stay around or not? That's kind of an opinion I've heard on AMP from some other marketers is, well, regardless of if this is going to last more than two or three years, I'm going to do it now to try to take opportunity of the value that is currently present even though it may be something that ultimately is not a long-term payoff? Well, I mean, the, 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 the short answer is that we have an AMP version of the Stone Temple website. <laughs> um, so, um, but uh, having, having said that, I mean, I think it, it, there's definitely a cost, you know, value uh, calculation to be done, right? I mean, authorship, I would have looked at that and said, oh, the perceived uh, benefit might not be that enduring, but they're running this experiment, and in spite of the fact that people had enormous difficulty implementing it, it was actually pretty simple to implement. It wasn't that hard. So you got to look at those cost value trade-offs. Uh, AMP is a definitely a higher mountain to climb in terms of learning how to implement it and dealing with it. And even if you have WordPress, where there's this WordPress plugin that probably well, is supposed to 
largely automate the whole process. The fact of the matter is the WordPress plugin is imperfect and there's patches you have to do to it, so that ends up making it hard. Um, uh, but the perceived benefit to me of AMP, uh, I, I really do think it's going to be around for a while. Um, so I think there's something to be gained. But it, it just gets back to that. How hard, how hard is it to try? And, you know, is, it, is the perceived benefit to me going to be big enough to, to go for it? Sure. I think that's a fair answer. Well, Jono, how about you wrap us up with your opinions, and uh, we'll have any last discussion we have, answer any audience questions, and, and call it a wrap. Awesome. Um, so I'm really, really bad at this. Um, I shouldn't admit that, but I get so excited about all the new kit, um, and I've got it wrong a few times. So I got um, ludicrously excited about Google Wave, which I think um, one of the challenges is that Google is terrible at marketing Google stuff. So Google Wave, Authorship, Google Glass, all could have and might in a different world have changed the world and been hugely successful, but the process of them coming to market um, is certainly not um, the smallest part of the reason they failed. So um, I think what's interesting about those is that if you judged them then and based on how well they were adopted, you'd miss the bigger picture was that Google Wave, for example, is now the backbone of Google Docs' collaborative editing. Authorship, um, as we touched on earlier, sure, there are no longer pictures in the search results and we're no longer tagging people's authors, but the concept of authored content correlating towards um, higher quality information and stuff that's better researched certainly feels like it resonates well. And Google, the success of Google Plus as an identity platform but not a social network is quite interesting. And then things like... Um, for years and years, Google have gradually said, you know what, don't give us meta keywords, don't try and tell us explicitly what your content's about, we'll work it out for you. And then a complete pivot to use schema, use JSON-LD, use open graph tags to explicitly tell us how to codify and structure and represent your content. So there's, there's a lot of difference on calling it a day one versus seeing it later in retrospect. I think the key to all of this is looking at... Um, does this directly improve the search experience or is it building competitive gap between them and their other service providers, the world of apps, Bing, other providers, and what's Google's motivation for doing it? And then as practitioners, if you can solve it with money or if you can outsource it or if you can scale it easily, it's probably going to die because everybody's going to throw money at it, all the agencies are going to get on board with scaling it and its value is going to diminish. And as a kind of more ephemeral concept, how close is it to good? So if you are responsible for a chain of restaurants, should you be trying to build campaigns and infographics or should you be training the chef? And Google's, Google will always prefer you to train the chef because that will correlate with all sorts of good signals and all sorts of good outcomes and those might not have directly represented direct impacts on the search results, etc. But that feels much closer to what will correlate with good outcomes and the right kind of science ranking. So regardless of what it is, that kind of distance to good is a, a good, good feel to work from. Sure. And the real question is, you know, were, were those failed experiments? Did, did Google learn something out of authorship that they were able exactly. to use down the road? And in terms of machine learning, and maybe this is an oversimplification, but the idea that you the base premise of machine learning is giving a training set, helping the machine get towards a higher percentage of accuracy, and then it can go off on its own and continue to train itself based on the original data you've given. Perhaps that's really what authorship ended up being. Perhaps that's what a lot of disavowed links have been. You know, here's a training set for Penguin to help it get better from humans, and then it can use that data to train itself to be more accurate. Maybe I'm oversimplifying, but... That's kind of, in, you know, in some ways, I see that as a possibility. Absolutely, and it's not even conspiratorial to imagine that. If, if you were employed by Google responsible for rolling out the next generation of Penguin, for example, that is exactly the kind of process you would want to put in place. You would want to harvest a whole load of smart people evaluating each other's work to qualify whether or not it's good. Uh, that's the perfect scenario at scale. And then, yeah, sure, roll that in and then tell everyone it was a failure or miscommunicate between departments because Google's left hand never knows what the right hand's doing, but either way, it was a success. Sure. Well, gentlemen, I really appreciate all of you taking the time to have this discussion with us today. Um, thank you to our audience for attending. 
any follow-up questions we were unable to get to, we can email. Um, thanks again, and uh, have a great day. Thank you. All right, thank you.